Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Good Grief. My name is Dr. Christine Malone, and in this podcast, we talk about trauma, tragedy, and survival. In each episode, I will interview someone that has gone through grief in some way, and we will discuss the impact it has had on their life. By sharing these stories, we hope that others won't feel alone should they be going through similar situations. Enjoy. Hey, listeners, thank you so much for joining me for my episode today. My guest is Ryan Skinner. He's the president of Cracking the Code. And in his 20s, he went from being in the top 1% of financial industry to becoming a heroin addict and ultimately lost everything. Since then, he's committed to a life of recovery, rebuilt his financial practice on spiritual principles, and he's now a dad and a mentor to many looking for, to better their lives personally and professionally. So, Ryan, tell us a bit about yourself. Hey, first of all, thank you for having me. Yes. Um, being from Boston, I speak 100 miles an hour. I mumble and I don't pronounce R, so we'll see how this goes. Um, quick <laughs> I, back try to, I, try, I try to slow yeah. myself down when I'm talking. Yeah. So um, growing up, you know, I, I had a pretty good childhood. I had two great parents. I had an aunt and uncle that were like the second set of parents. Um, I did have another uncle who was abusive. Um, he was an alcoholic. And the sad thing was that he was gay. And I always, at a young age, I just associate gay with alcohol and, and, oh, and yeah. abuse. You know, I mean, he was, he was vicious. I mean, everything from putting cigarettes out of my arms to just, just some screwed up stuff. Fortunately enough, he died when I was in second grade. So uh, that ended. Um, at the time, I didn't, even all through my childhood, I didn't even realize it left an impact. And uh, we grew up, and all my cousins and my sister, they all kind of grew up a little more normal. And I was just afraid of everything. I was afraid of everything. Um, I was pretty fortunate by, so great, in fifth grade, I had a teacher who just, he was just, he just was convinced I would never do anything. I couldn't read. I had dyslexia and learning disabilities, reading comprehension. Back then, they didn't know what it was. He was just a bad student. I got made fun of a lot. So I acted out. And um, the teacher looked at my mother and he said, listen, if you can get this kid through high school, you've done a good job. He's not a smart kid. And I was right there. And I wanted to say, you know, I can hear you. But uh, back then, I was a shy, awkward kid. And my mother looked at him. She goes, no, he's going to go to college. He'll do just fine. Thanks. And so the next year, I went to Catholic school with my cousins. Um. And, you know, my mother thought my grades would go up if I didn't get picked on. And frankly, my grades didn't go up because it was a high school. It was so hard. I mean, these kids are doing a half hour homework every night. I was doing three to four hours. I was coming from public school, you know. Um, seventh grade, it all changed. I had a teacher who noticed I had low self-esteem. She was, Catholic school teachers don't pay social security tax. So they don't receive social security. Makes sense. She was reading one book after another, learning how to build your own investments, create your own social security. One book said, if you could draw with a crayon, you can buy it. But who can't draw with a crayon, right? And she noticed I was gifted with numbers. Even as a kid, I was just, I've always been a freak with numbers. So she said, Ryan, I'm going to give you $50,000 of fake money, a subscription to invest his business daily, and I'm going to send you on your way. I bought Chrysler, not because they made cars, but they had the highest ratio of companies that bought their parts for repairs. Back in the 80s and 90s, Ford and GM bought Chrysler parts for repairs. Gatorade, um, Nike, anything Jordan went near, Michael Jordan. And you know what? Um, I beat the market. She read the letter the author of a book she read. His name is Peter Lynch. He happened to be pretty big time. I didn't know who he was. He came, introduced himself, and said, Ryan, we're going to teach you. We're going to cultivate this gift God gave you. Every Friday after school, you teach her and I. And I said, no, thank you. I said, I don't want to go from the dumb kid in one school to the geek over here. I just want to fit in. I get home. My parents always had two jobs. My dad's car's in the driveway. Sure enough, I thought he had a migraine. And he's in the kitchen having tea. He said, Ryan, I'm home to inform you that every Friday you're going to go. And someday you'll thank me. You know, I always tell people, when I was a kid, you do what your parents told you to do. You know, I have a 12-year-old stepdaughter, and uh, she thinks it's like a democracy in my house. You know, I tell her it's the kingdom of Ryan. She laughs. So I did that. I fell in love with it. Eighth grade, Women's Row Magazine did a feature called The Whiskey Wall Street. Um, Murray Povich had me on. I was, it, was, it was pretty good. It, it exposed me to a lot of stuff that my mom was a housekeeper by day. She cleaned office at night. And although it's a very honorable job, um, I, you know, I didn't want that. You know, and uh, this gave me an opportunity for something else. And I found my niche. My niche was numbers. And. High school, I happened to be the vice principal's retired stockbroker who was there trying to keep an eye on his kid. And God, you know, the spirit of the universe, you know, we talked before we got on. Like when I say God, I mean the universe, that energy out there. Call it, you know, spirit, call it whatever the hell you want. I was always being guided. And, you know, in high school and college, I landed in some good spots, but I also landed in some bad spots. I idolized some friends that were really tough guys. And um, they're still good friends today. We just live very different lives. And, Next thing I know, I was trying to, you know, I was always so insecure. I'd be anything, I, you know, I didn't mind being a tough guy with those guys, a geek with those guys. Um, I never got into drugs. You know, I drank like a gypsy, you know, but what happened was, well, three years out of college, I had already bought a house and I'm living in there and I'm drinking a lot. And then 
I had a, so I bled out. I had this thing called a Mallory Weiss tear. You, you may have heard of it. Basically, mm-hmm. if you drink too much, you have bleeding ulcers. Um, when I go back after having the surgery, I was in a coma for a little while. And I go back and they said, um, you know, we got bad news. We found cancer in your stomach, cancerous tumors. So they said, the good news is it's on the outside of your stomach. It didn't spread. You're going to be fine. But we have to do a few surgeries. And, uh, so the next nine months, I had about six surgeries, all minor surgeries. But they put me on Oxycontin. Mm-hmm. And Oxycontin did what it's supposed to do. It took everything. It took the pain, took everything I worked at. At that point, I had two houses, or three houses, two cars, a decent amount of money. And uh, within three years, I'm in the I'm in a Dunkin' Donuts bathroom using toilet water because the sink doesn't work, using dirty needles and a homeless. You know, and I went from, we talked about rehabs. I went from going to the $30,000 rehab where you can give them an order what you want to eat because you want low carbs, you want this. And then every 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 Thanksgiving and Christmas, I would be in a different detox. And I, usually the one up in Danvers around here. And my mother used to call it the Danvers Hotel because she was so disgusted. So I was just there so much. And the, the final place I got, I went, I rehab, I detoxed in jail. When I got sentenced to jail, I just sat there and twitched. 28 days, no sleep. That was hot. Um, it was exactly what I needed. I'd love to tell you I got out of jail after. I, I did. I got out. I got sober. I, I worked hard. I had some success. And... um. I took all the spiritual principles that you get you sober and I applied it to business. I lowered, I cut my fees down by like 90%. I mean, I literally did everything I was told not to do. In my business, I'm always in the top one or two of the country at what I do. Um, I don't always make the most because I, I don't charge the fees, but I manage the most. My client retention is high. Uh, I had, you know, I did go through some struggles. I had a lot of surgeries and it was very high to stop taking the payments when I had the surgeries. But through the grace of God, I never had to go back out. I never found myself shooting heroin or drinking alcohol or doing anything like on the street, so to speak. Yeah. And I just had those principles applying to more and more and things expanded. You know, today I've got a decent life. Don't get me wrong. It's not always perfect. Out of insecurities, I was getting older. I married somebody. I married the wrong person. Um, she married the wrong person as well. And, you know, it was, we had a child. We did um, fertility. We had a beautiful little girl. Uh, but she has autism. It's very hard for her. And like, so there's always, you know, life is lifey. You know, I heard a girl say that once. As corny as it sounds, it is. You know, you, you think life's going to be a certain way and then the playbook changes. Yeah. No, it's very true. You you and I have a couple of things in common. I, I also married the wrong person at one point in time in my life as well. But And I'll even give you that, that I think he married the wrong person too. So I hadn't thought about it before. So yeah, you actually made me reflect a little bit when you said that. But yes. So um, did any of your other siblings have any issues with this uncle or was it just you? No, my sister and my cousins, no, nobody else. Okay, just you. Just pick, People pick. like that know how to prey on kids. They know the shy, know. nervous kid. I know. I know. I know. It's, it's really... You know, scared. Like, if you tell him I'm going to kill your dog, and I'd be so scared about my dog. You know, like, he knew how to play the game. Yeah, no, I, I hear that. They, yeah, they, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So, um, you once you you would only do the, the, the rehab the one time, and then you were in the, then the, the real... No, rehab, I did about 30 or 40 rehabs. Oh, you did? Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. so that, that was my the first person I've talked to that only did it one time. Okay, okay, I got you. Oh, yeah, no, if you get it the first time, God bless you. But yeah, no, for me, I had to learn the highway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you take kind of your experiences? I know you're, you're with, with with number, but how do you take kind of some of the experiences for what you've been through with not only childhood trauma, but these the years of addiction? And how does that work with your business and your coaching and so on with other people? Um, you know, it's strange. Well, I was also, you know, I always say I was blessed. I have bipolar and you know, some other ADHD and some of that other stuff. And, you know, the curse is the blessing. You know what I mean? Because once you hit the bottom, it's just a springboard to the top. You just have to apply things. And yeah. so what I do is I sit with people. I say, all right, let's get to know you. And they'll talk about their numbers, their financial goals and all that bullshit. And that's all it is. Excuse my language, but it's just BS. And I said, let's get down to the cause and conditions of what makes you tick. What's going to make you happy? And then we're going to say, how do we get there? And then what happens is like attracts like. You teach them how to be their authentic self. And once you're authentic, the right clients, the right people are going to come to you because there's some sort of energy in this world. I don't know how to describe it. Like, how do we sync up, you and I? You know, it's just some sort of synchronicity you like that I can't really explain, but it works. Yeah. I, I believe in things happening for a purpose. I'm a real believer and have been for like all of my life, even bad things. I think they all happen for a purpose. And that's not always fun to think about that. I don't, yeah, I don't think there's somebody out there signing these things, but I do think that, yeah, things are, are yeah. Fun. It's, you know, for reasons that people I've met that I'm just, wow, I can't believe that person came into my life and whatever that might be. So, yeah, that's 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 very, very. I want to congratulate you on the um, coming out of that addiction. And as we were talking about before, I started recording. I have family members that have been there and it's it's not I, I know it's not an easy thing to do. And it's not I know a lot of people tend to look at someone with um, an addiction and think that they're just weak. And why can't you just stop this? And why don't you this and why don't you that? And and 
I know that that's not the case. And so it's kind of a congratulations for, for doing that. I, I appreciate that because to be very honest, I was that guy. I remember watching somebody take a Rolex off his wrist, give it to a friend of mine who's a drug dealer for one pill. And I used to think, this guy is what a weak piece of shit. Excuse my language. And I remember thinking that. And then, you know what? I remember being at the bottom of being, and selling my last watch yeah. to a jeweler. And yeah. spending all the money just on drugs. Yeah. No, uh, I know it's a vicious, vicious, ugly cycle for sure. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? No, I mean, I'd rather do Q&A. You're in charge. Uh, well, I've, I've pretty much asked you the question I was going to ask you about, but really mostly about how, getting over the addiction and how you've become, you know, successful since then. Um, and it sounds like you've you've pulled in what you know to be your natural gifts, which not all not all people realize what those are. I think we all do have gifts, but I, I think some people have a harder time finding them or maybe don't even ever find them. I know, as I was sharing with you before we started recording, for me, uh, it's teaching. And I didn't realize that till I was almost 40. So, you know, it's kind of like we 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 kind of learn what we get and we give it back to people. So um, tell me a bit about your um, your uh, cracking the code, your your, your podcast. So we the, the name of the business is Cracking the Code. Well, they, they call it Cracking the Code with Ryan Skinner. It's the actual podcast. You know, as we discussed before, most people are successful. If you look at a padlock, they have four numbers to line up. Most successful people, business owners, people who have successful careers, marriages, they can get two out of the four because they're pretty they're pretty natural, right? It's a natural talent. On good days, they get three. And every so often, maybe every three months, they get that fourth number. How do you get that fourth number more often? You know, how do guys like Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan go to that next level? They're really not that much more talented than other guys. It takes hard work. You know, I tell guys like Coach, you got to have hard work. You have discipline. You got to have grit. You better have a you know a culture of like strength. You better get up every day and do the same thing over and over again. Be like Rain Man. But then, in addition to it, like how do you get to that fourth number? It's really learning how to tap into yourself to like great up part of you. None of us do this alone. You know, if I could take any credit for anything, I would. I've done nothing. Every ounce of success I have, it's come from somebody mentoring me. Um, I, I literally, every good idea that comes out of my mouth, I've stolen from somebody else. The only thing I try to do is make it so that it's manageable and pliable to people that I coach. You know, make it so that they can apply it in their life and get stronger. Yeah, great. And you're having great success with that. So obviously it's it's working and it's it, you you found your niche. You found where you belong, which is really cool. And I'm, get, I'm guessing, I'm gathering from you that you really enjoy it as well. I love it. You know, at first I was just doing it as a hobby yeah. and people were asking me, Hey, other advisors and business guys. Yeah. Then I thought, geez, I really enjoy this. You know? So then I started doing it and obviously charging, yeah. but I literally make it based on the client. I mean, I have some clients that don't pay me. They just can't afford to pay me. I said, don't worry about it. Yeah. I have other guys in, you know, you know, folks that are paying upward of 20, 30 grand a month because they can afford it. And I can add that kind of value to their practice. Yeah. It's really all what you can deliver. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's awesome. Well, Ryan, it's been a pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Good Grief. To hear more about my personal story, please pick up a copy of my book, The Day I Became the Spider Killer, a memoir of trauma, tragedy, and survival, available in paperback, Kindle, and Audible via Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online book retailers.